Tailored Vision Productions presents Doctor Who Short Trips The Children of Earl King by Lewis Leverett Read by Miles Taylor Norway, 1661, December the 24th, Christmas Eve. In a small stubborn house that sat on the edge of a town called Eroskabing, that's where Hannah stood, trembling terribly, her hands white and her mouth dry, answering the questions of two strangers. And strangers, in this particular instance, was exactly the right word. They were the strangest people she'd ever encountered in her short and quiet life. But curiously, she trusted them. She told them what she knew. She told them what happened to her. What happened to the children. And the doctor feared it more than he'd care to admit. What is it, doctor? Lily inquired, a cold, unwanted feeling descending upon her. The Earl King, he said. Is that what took the children? The doctor nodded, unspeaking. So Lily questioned him again. What is it then? The Earl King. The King of the Fairies. At least, that's what they say, the Doctor explained. It's folklore. Danish folklore, and nothing more. Or so I believed. Goethe. Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, a German writer, wrote a poem about the Earl King, using the stories he'd heard. And that's the trouble with stories. You're never quite sure when they're fiction. Yeah, but... What does the poem say? What are we dealing with, Doctor? Lily asked, uneasy. The father now gallops, with terror half wild. He grasps in his arms the poor, shuddering child. He reaches his courtyard with toil and with dread. The child in his arms finds he motionless, dead. The doctor was too lost in thought to notice the terror his recital had produced in both Hannah and his companion. But what actually is it? And what does it want with the children? Who knows? Every story differs. In Goethe's interpretation, it's not described at all. But this is good, the doctor decided. How is this possibly in any way good? Lily asked. A creature which can only be seen by children that brings with it a great mist and whose victims can hear the chatter of its maniacal companions but never see them? It's good, Lily, because we can finally put a name to all this. It's good, Lily, because we can finally put a name to all this. The Earl King is here. I'm almost certain of it. Or at least, the truth behind the legend that became the Earl King. Ooh! The Doctor stepped back, holding out his forefinger in thought. We missed something, Lily something big. If anyone in this town had actually spoke to me, I'd have known it a lot earlier. Lily, the graveyard. What about it? Lily replied. Describe it to me. Not the stones, but the ground. The grass. The grass? Well, it was kind of messy, I guess. Like it hadn't been cut in a while, Lily recalled. In a word, I suppose, she pondered. Untouched. The doctor clicked his fingers and pointed his index in her direction. Untouched. So it wasn't just me, he said. That can't be right, can it? The grass should be different where the graves are. Fresher. You said they only buried them recently, but they can't have. Which leaves only one logical answer. Hannah, there aren't any bodies, are there? The doctor gently inquired. Hannah, still carrying the corner, shook her head. That's a bit pessimistic, isn't it? Lily, let me put you in a scenario. You're a mother, and one day your child just disappears. Maybe you'd only just let them out of your sight. Maybe they'd been out playing with their friends, and they just vanish. No trace at all. What do you think? What do you do? Well, I'd go look for them, Lily answered. But what if you can't find them? What do you do then? Lily paused, deep in thought. Then it's hopeless. You can't explain how they disappeared, and... You can't find them anywhere. Then you have to accept that they're gone. 
she replied. What? No, you'd keep on searching, and you'd keep on searching until the day you... Hang on. The doctor stepped closer to his companion. You would never say that. And you'd never have suggested that we leave this place when we found the gravestones. What are you saying? Lily asked. Almost every being in existence evolves to survive in its habitat, right? The doctor asked rhetorically. They develop unique skills and traits that allow them to go on living. So what is the Earl King's ability? We know it can't be seen or heard by adults, but that's not enough. No, no, no. It needs something more. It takes children. That's a dangerous hobby. You're bound to anger a few people. So it needs some way of preventing it being outnumbered. Something that controls thought, controls emotion. You said it yourself, Lily. There's something about this place you didn't like that made you act strangely. This place makes you want to leave. Run, hide, surrender. Did you notice how much quieter it got when we entered the town? No wind, no sea, no birds, just silence. Don't you see now? That's the Earl King's ability. It exerts a literal atmosphere over its hunting place, one that plays with minds, makes you think the worst. That way, it doesn't have to fight off a rebellion wherever it goes, because it makes its victims pacifists. Oh! The doctor shoved a hand into his pocket and retrieved his fatal device. That explains why the sonic doesn't work, he said. The atmosphere must be messing up the signals. Are you saying that it's in my head, Doctor? Controlling me a and Hannah? Lily asked. Well, sort of, yes, the Doctor answered, seeming irritatingly unconcerned. But don't worry. I'm not in control of my own mind, and you reckon there's nothing to worry about? Lily retorted. Yes, I do reckon, actually. For starters, you're not being controlled, just manipulated. So fight it, he replied. Okay, that's all well and good, but we still haven't actually gotten anywhere. I mean, Fighting off bad thoughts isn't going to solve anything, is it? Of course we've gotten somewhere. We finally know who we're up against, albeit vaguely, and how they're doing what they're doing. Well, again, vaguely. But we know what's causing everyone to give up. And I've got just the thing for it. Lily stood in the doorway of Hannah's abode watching the Doctor as he made his way back from the TARDIS. He'd only been gone a few minutes, but they'd been an awfully long few minutes. She'd spoken briefly to Hannah, who seemed to be loosening up ever so slightly, and learnt a little of her story. Hannah told her of her mother and father. Lily had apologised, repeatedly. It's just what you do when you hear things like that. That was the end of her measly attempt at conversation. It turned sharply back to silence, and, silently, Lily begged for the Doctor's return. And here he was at last, shiny apparatus in hand. I confiscated this from a very difficult rat scorook of Alibatorian a while back, he explained, placing the silver contraption down on the ground. It was very unimpressive, Lily thought, whatever it was. As far as she was concerned, it was just a metal box, about a foot wide and a foot long, with an unintelligible concoction of wires protruding from its silver case. But she was pretty certain that the doctor would soon explain its purpose to her. And he did. It's supposed to emit emotions, he stated, sitting down and crossing his legs as he tinkered with his newfound toy. But with a little bit of magic, it might just do the opposite. You mean it'll cancel out the negative thoughts? asked Lily. Fingers crossed, the doctor replied, distracted somewhat by the task at hand. Oh, well, I still think we should put everyone in the TARDIS and just leave while we've got the chance. Hannah would be safe in there, wouldn't she? Sorry, you're suggesting that we take 50, 60 people from the 17th century, show them a space-time machine, and then what? The Doctor inquired, looking away from his gadget and straight into the eyes of his companion. Fly them to a safer place in time? Leaving a whole town unpopulated and changing over a thousand years of its history? Forget rewriting the pages, that's just... Forget rewriting the pages, that's closer to burning the book. Besides, whatever this Earl King creature's up to, I don't think it's going to stop with Erskubik, do you? It might not stop with Denmark. It might not stop with Earth. No, we've got to act, here and now. Sorry, Lily solemnly replied. It was just a suggestion. Here we go, the doctor announced. He got up from the floor energetically and stared intently at the device as it slowly hummed into life. Is it working? Lily queried, yet to notice any change besides the faint vibrations of the machine. Oh, I think so, the doctor responded procuring the sonic screwdriver from his pocket and scanning the air around him. Aha! It's working again! The Earl King's grip is weakening. 
give it ooh, 20 minutes and the people will be as right as rain. Then we can get down to business. The doctor gave his companion an optimistic smile as he stepped away from the machine. She didn't return it. And I'm sorry for snapping, Lily, he added. I think the atmosphere is starting to get to me too. Still, shouldn't be a problem now that I've got this thing going. Lily wasn't so positive. Peering over the doctor's shoulder, she saw something, and she didn't need pessimism for it to fill her mind with fresh horror. The concern of the Earl King's atmosphere, whatever that meant, was hardly a concern at all now, she thought. Lily pointed at the spectacle, and the doctor turned to share the view. Ah, you've heard of the ripple effect, Lily. Yeah, she replied. Well, I think I've given you a live demonstration, except replace the pebble in the water with, say, a hydrogen bomb? The doctor regularly tried to distract Lily with often jarring humour, she'd observed. Or perhaps he was trying to distract himself. Whichever it was, it wasn't working. Not today. Lily, the doctor, and even Hannah now, who'd moved to the front of the house, stood and gaped at the sight. It was the sky. It was changing. The atmosphere the doctor had described, as much as Lily believed him, couldn't be seen. It was just a theory. Until now. The sky was turning red. A horrible, violent, bloody red. The hapless trio stood and stared as an orb of red sky and red air formed around the poor little town. There was the rest of the world, and then there was Eriskrabing. They were utterly, indisputably alone, at the mercy of the Earl King. So, the good news, the doctor said. The mood manipulation is still being suppressed, so we can finally try and convince the people of the town to help us to fight the Earl King. Bad news, I don't think we have the time. What's happening? Hannah cried, now just behind the travellers. Well, I think by activating my little friend here, I might have poked the beehive, so to speak. But something tells me that we won't be able to swat away whatever's coming out of it. The doctor noticed how bad an effect his rather candid explanation was having on the child. Not to worry, I've got a plan. You've kept that to yourself pretty well, Lily remarked, a little cheek and gusto returning to her voice. Y yeah, well, it is a fairly new plan. About ten seconds old, to be precise. Still, I'm at least a bit percent sure that it'll work. Okay then, Doctor, I'm all ears, said Lily. Before the Doctor could respond, he was distracted by the sound of distant chatter. The townsfolk were approaching, and not just the men from the church. Slowly, silently, the women of Eriskabing left their houses to marvel at the sinister light show, some of whom tore their eyes away and headed also for Hannah and the strangers. The Doctor, as always, was first to speak. Ah, I see you finally learnt how to walk. Still, wasn't your fault. I'd love to explain, but as you can see, we've got a matter of a little more urgency to deal with. The rugged old man who spoke before stepped forward, apparently the self-elected spokesman. Granddaughter, he said, looking over at Hannah, who didn't respond. Have you been speaking with these strangers? Yes, Grandfather. They're nice people. The doctor says he might be able to help us. So I've heard, the old man replied an air of patronising authority in his delivery. Well, Doctor? Yes, uh, right, well, the Doctor stalled, somewhat reluctant to explain. Before I tell you my plan, I think you lot might need a quick update. I think I know what's happened to your children. They were all taken by a creature, a beast of some kind, known as the Earl King. Which means that maybe, just maybe, your children are still alive. And if they're still alive, then I might just be able to find them and bring them home. Only downside, the Earl King's got us trapped and it's most likely coming for us any minute now. Or more specifically, for the last child of Erskubing. The doctor looked at Hannah and attempted a reassuring smile. It didn't work. How do we stop it? The man inquired, walking to Hannah and taking her hand. Good, I like the person that skips to the important questions. 17th century people are so much more accepting of the whole monsters aliens thing. Wasn't so easy at the opening of the second London Eye, I tell you. The doctor finally recognised how great a tangent he'd managed to embark upon, and quickly course-corrected. Anyway, as far as I can see, there's only one good solution. Well, I, I say good. But I'll need your cooperation, Hannah. Is it dangerous? The old man queried. I'll do it, Hannah exclaimed, before her grandfather's question could even be answered. She couldn't put her finger on why, but she trusted this strange, inexplicable man. Besides... She couldn't see any other good options. 
She wanted this to all be over. Hena, the old man said, concern in his eyes. Good girl. I promise it's not dangerous so long as it works. And it'll work so long as you relax, the doctor explained, stepping towards Hannah and her grandfather. He looked over at the old man, seeing no alternative, and also strangely trusting the visitor. He reluctantly nodded. The doctor slowly and gently knelt down so that his eyes met Hannah's and placed his fingertips on her forehead. Now, Hannah, I need you to empty your mind. Easier said than done, I know, but I need you to forget your fears, forget your worries, and focus on a happy thought. Picture the happiest memory in your mind and keep watching it until you can't think of anything else, he softly instructed. Hannah complied. She found the command an easy one. An image of her mother and father eating and laughing and eating some more played over and over in her mind. She smiled. A sad smile. That's good, Hannah. Just relax, said the doctor. With the surgeon's precision, he placed his forehead on hers. Lily and the people of Ereskabing watched in anticipation, the old man's hand still tightly gripped to his granddaughter's. And then a wind began. A few months ago, no one would have noticed such a thing, but the people of the town hadn't heard wind or bird life or anything of the sort since the disappearances began. Lily knew what it meant. It was coming. The doctor had noticed too. He didn't move. Doctor, Lily whispered. I know, Lily, I know. Hannah was focused on the memory, but she couldn't help but notice the cold, gentle wind nibble at her neck. She opened her eyes. What's happening? She asked. Nothing, Hannah. Concentrate on your memory. Concentrate on your family, the doctor replied. It's, it's coming, isn't it? It's coming from me, she whimpered. Only if you stop concentrating. Come on, Hannah. Close your eyes and think of your family. Your mother and father. How much you loved them. How much they loved you. Do that, and I promise that thing will never hurt you. Hannah nodded anxiously, rubbed her eyes, and concentrated. Harder than she'd ever concentrated before. And then it appeared. Or so Lily inferred, as a great mist drifted into the cold little town. Hannah could have seen it, edging closer with every one of the poor girl's heartbeats, but her eyes were shut tight. She brought that painfully beautiful memory back to the front of her mind. It was working, whatever on earth the doctor was doing. She could feel him tell her so. She had no idea how, but Hannah could hear the stranger in her mind, whispering reassurances. If only there hadn't been other voices. Hannah could hear them just like before. Inexplicable, maniacal, horrible, unintelligible chatter, as if a hundred hysterical children circled her. But these were no children of Earth. She was going to open her eyes. Focus, Hannah, focus! She heard the doctor plead with her in her mind. Just a few seconds longer, he added. Whatever she was doing, the doctor had promised it would work, and she believed him. She kept her eyes shut. She'd do it. She was going to win. Without warning, Hannah exhaled violently and fell back. Her grandfather, who'd been motionless since taking her hand, caught the child mid-fall and cradled her in her arms. What have you done? He cried. The doctor held out his hands in negotiation. She's fine, completely fine, I promise you. The doctor got up from his knees and dusted himself off as Hannah lay unconscious in her grandfather's arms. Did it work? Lily frantically asked. We're about to find out, replied the doctor. He stepped forward to confront his silent enemy, entirely guessing the direction. He blinked. Come on then, Mr. Old King, any time you like, he said, the gentle blowing of the wind his only reply. What's supposed to happen, Doctor? Lily inquired, too stiff to bite her nails. He didn't answer, and Lily wasn't going to ask again. If the Doctor wasn't telling her something, there must have been a reason. He never keeps things from me, she thought. But whatever was supposed to be happening, it certainly wasn't working yet. And although no one could see it, the Earl King was drifting ever closer to his victim. If Hannah was awake, she'd have heard the licking of the lips of a thousand insatiable creatures boundlessly excited by the thought of the inevitable coup de grace. Oh, how they loved it. The doctor blinked again, harder this time. Nothing. He looked at Hannah, and then at her grandfather. Take Hannah. Get her as far away from here as you can, and don't stop running. But which way do I run? 
the old man replied. I don't know where the spirit is. How can I get away from it? Well, if my plan doesn't work, there's no use in her staying here. You'll just have to... Hang on a minute. The doctor saw something. A blur, the faintest notion of a presence, but definitely something. Come on, come on, come on, he said under his breath. He blinked, even harder than before. And there it was, in all its horrid glory. The Earl King. It must have been eight feet long, maybe more, the doctor thought. Although it was hard to tell where the creature ended and the mist began. Its hands and feet, whose thin and bony nature suggested that they were ready to snap, trailed off into black and red smoke that whispered into nothing. Its whole body was little more than a skeleton, in fact, and the doctor could see its spine twist and turn as it crawled towards him. That was what struck the doctor more than anything else. It was crawling. He'd imagined some great legendary spirits floating above him in might and evil, a booming voice commanding its unseeable minions. But it crawled, writhed even. It looked weak, contorting as if every movement caused it unimaginable pain. The doctor would have felt sorry for it if he didn't know what it had done. And then there was that face. He never tried to judge by appearances, but this thing was utterly evil. It didn't frown or snarl or growl or cry. It smiled. Dozens upon dozens of putrid teeth, somehow sharper and even more pointed than the rest of its grotesque physiognomy. It might have been in pain, but it was enjoying this. He gulped as the Earl King slithered even closer. The Doctor could have run, it didn't seem in any rush, but something told him it would be as futile as it would be tiring. Besides, that wasn't part of the plan. It's there, the Doctor announced, assuming someone wanted an explanation. They usually did. I can see it. But how can you see it? Does that mean that it's after you now? Yep, he replied. So your great plan was to make yourself its lunch? Yep, he replied again. If it's going after you, does that mean she's safe? The old man asked. Yes, she's safe, for now, the doctor responded. Easy, really, he began, pretending someone had asked. Just a little psychic transference. Come on then, whatever you are, it's me, Hannah, the last child in the village. Supper time. The doctor threw out his arms in invitation and gave the creature a beaming smile. Doctor, the spirit will kill you, the old man exclaimed. Oh, will it? That's a shame. I haven't finished my bucket list yet. I don't suppose there's any chance the hanging gardens of Babylon are anywhere nearby. Or did I do that one already? What are you doing, Doctor? Like you said, I'm being lunch. And in a breath, the Doctor was gone. His companion shouted into the night, but he wasn't coming back. Not just yet. Nowhere. That was the only way the doctor could describe his new location. Well, at least it was a location, he voicelessly remarked. He had been right. The creature didn't kill, at least not there and then. It took yet another successful deduction, if success was not yet being dead. Although he could in fact have been dead, he supposed. It was too dull to be heaven, but it could very well have been hell. Quiet, plain, peaceful. Sounded like hell to him. Then, without warning, he started moving. He wasn't walking, in fact, he didn't have input on the scenario whatsoever, he was just sort of gliding. He wasn't sure how he knew he was moving either. There were no points of reference to use, no air to push through, but he was certain he was moving. His suspicions were confirmed, however, when he spotted a figure on the horizon, if there was such a thing as a horizon in a place like this. No, he corrected himself, figures, plural rows and rows of them, standing absolutely upright, surrounded by a sort of wispy black and red mist. This, the Doctor quickly decided, was the stomping ground of the Earl King, and the Doctor was fast approaching. Either that, or it was approaching him. Regardless, he didn't like the options. And he didn't much care for his next revelation either. He'd reached his destination, right in the centre of it all, 
engulfed by an endless sea of black and red. From here, he could see the figures clearly. He'd found the children, each poor soul hovering lifelessly in the not air, heartlessly strapped into an unthinkable contraption, their open mouths filled by disgusting tubes and wires, their noses and ears the same. It was unlike anything the Time Lord had ever witnessed. There was no sense to the arrangement, part metal, part organic, part gas, part… well, even the Doctor didn't know. And nothing seemed to end, nor start, it all just sort of was. The Doctor finished inspecting, he'd seen quite enough. Science left his mind, emotion replaced it. He was in the Earl King's realm now, and it was about time he spoke to this nightmarish creation. But he couldn't. He couldn't open his mouth. It suddenly dawned on the Doctor that he couldn't move at all. He'd probably have the power taken from him when he arrived, he just hadn't thought to try until now. Racking his brains, he came to the same conclusion he always seemed to arrive at in the end when things got very, very hard. Try again. So he tried again, and five times more, and five times after that. And then he spoke. Whatever you are, the doctor began, his words strained and quiet. You better have a very good explanation for all this. He went to carry on, but something stopped him. The sight of a monster. The pathetic, horrifying mockery of life was approaching. Unmistakable, even from such a distance. Nice of you to join me. So, what's the plan? What? I suppose you're thinking of hooking me up to one of whatever those things are, the doctor said, as if certain that it wasn't going to happen. In truth, he was less than convinced. Far less. He was all too aware of how rapidly the Earl King was approaching, but the doctor was gaining strength, his words leaving him with much less effort than before. So, what's it all for? Why do it? Come on, are you really going to bring me all the way here not to talk to me? Just tell me what's going on and maybe we can come to an agreement. Because those children aren't dead. Not yet, anyway. So maybe this is one of those really good days and there's an honest explanation to all this. Oh, I'd love that to be true. But the way you're looking at me now... The doctor trailed off as the thing made its way ever closer. It stopped with a creak, an arm's length from the traveller. The Earl King could have reached out and touched its prey if it wanted to. The Doctor was thankful that it didn't. Its face contorted as it looked up at the Time Lord, like a parent pulling a silly face for the amusement of their child, and he could have sworn that the creature winked. He didn't have time to ponder this, however, as he felt himself begin to move again, backwards this time. He saw something that he instantly wished he hadn't. There was an empty space between two of the children, reserved just for him. He grunted in effort, desperately trying to inspire some sort of motion in his body. Alas, besides his vision and speech, neither of which had helped him much so far, it was achingly apparent that he was not in control. Not in any sense. No, you don't understand. You're making a mistake. I'm not Hannah, the doctor pleaded. The creature didn't react. It's just a cheap trick to get me here. A simple psychotransference. Hannah's memories in my head. Just enough to convince your hunting instinct that I was a child. That I was her. I'm not Hannah. Do you understand? I'm not Hannah. It, apparently, did not understand. The Time Lord racked his brains. He developed a very strong deck over the millennia, but he was running out of cards. Fast. The empty space behind him seemed to open wide. A baby ready for the choo-choo train. He struggled some more, though he was fairly certain it wasn't making any difference. The Doctor thought back to his bucket list remark from a few minutes previously. He'd said it flippantly at the time, but he considered it with much more solemnity now. No one was coming to rescue him. He was certain of that. How could they? It was just him and that. And that was winning. He tried one last tactic. Stop this! At once! He shouted, instantly feeling silly despite the fear and panic. This latest voice wasn't quite up to scratch in the Gravitas department. Regardless, he continued. Do you understand what you're dealing with, do you? Well, I'll tell you. I'm your worst nightmare. I'm a Time Lord from the planet Gallifrey. I was there at the greatest war the universe has ever known, and I brought it to an end. I might choose to call myself the Doctor, but I've been given many names. 
the Predator, the Great Exterminator, the Balliard, the Oncoming Storm, the Destroyer of Worlds, the Doctor of War. I'm everything that stands between you and what you want, so stop this now, or you won't live to regret what you've done. The Doctor hated those names of the Passion, resented that reputation, but he found it could come in very useful from time to time. As much as he was reluctant to admit it, when wise words and reason couldn't solve a problem, sometimes the pointless bellow of a warrior could. He looked deep into the creature's eyes, waiting for some sort of response. It grinned. The Doctor didn't stop moving. He was still being pulled back, his empty white grave breathing down his neck. He couldn't stop it. He tried everything and he really, truly couldn't stop it. Questions piled up in his mind. What lay ahead? What lurked behind? It had suddenly occurred to the Doctor that the answer might be nothing. Nothing lay ahead. Nothing behind. It could really be the end. Or worse. Those children weren't dead. They weren't anything. Was that his fate? An indefinite state of nothingness? An eternity of zero? He had seconds. He tried to speak one last time but couldn't. Not that it mattered, he thought. He had nothing left to say. Still being dragged ever so slightly back, the doctor knew he was inches from his fate. He counted down the seconds in his head. Three, two, one, stopped. He wanted desperately to close his eyes, desperately, but he couldn't. He stared, defeated, as a hundred black and red arms grew from nowhere and snaked towards him. The smoky coils tickled his skin impishly as they made their way into his body. He closed his lips and kept them shut tight, the metal of the tendrils prized them open, the gas danced in. The doctor felt a horrible feeling pass through him feeling of nothing. He was being drained, not of moisture or nutrients, but it felt as if he was being drained of life itself. Love, hate, joy, fury, indifference. It was all going. The doctor closed his eyes. And then it stopped. He opened an eye and looked around as much as the paralysis allowed. Inexplicably, smoke began to swirl and swivel around him. The slithering aggressors within the Doctor recoiled and retreated in desperate panic. Strength surged through the Traveller. He could speak again, as the painful moan of who knows what pierced his mind. That doesn't sound too good, does it? He said mischievously. Somehow, he summoned the energy to flash a wry smile in the creature's direction, who looked directly into the eyes of its prisoner. The Doctor's gaze was quickly distracted, however, by the smoke. It was changing colour. Black turned to dark red, and then the dark red turned lighter, and that turned lighter still. The Doctor was the epicentre, at the eye of the storm. The last few tendrils of smoke and metal pulled themselves from the Doctor's ears and writhed in agony in the bright red air. Of course, he whispered, still watching as the space around him filled more and more with fire red smoke. What's wrong, mate? Not to your taste? No. I don't suppose I am. For the first time since arriving in the place of the Earl King, the Doctor could move. He strode forwards and looked down at his pain-stricken adversary. Because you've only been taking children, haven't you? And that's no coincidence. You need them specifically. I'm right, aren't I? Whatever it is you're taking, it only exists in children. Ego, I don't have it. So, plugging me into your rotten system has thrown a bit of a spanner into your works, hasn't it? You've poisoned the well, Earl King. And you're the only one that drinks from it. So, what now? The doctor slid his hands into his pockets and leaned towards the creature. It scowled back at him, and everything went silent. Just for a moment. <laughs> Suddenly, the realm of the Earl King screamed in pain, every particle spasming in unparalleled agony, and the doctor felt very, very tired. He awoke with a jolt. To his surprise, he wasn't dead. That fact never ceased to amaze him. 
To his further surprise, he was back in Erskabing, lying clumsily on the cold hard rock outside Hannah's house, exactly where he'd been before. But none of this was important, not compared to what he noticed next. They were back. All the children were back. A hundred parents embracing their children in grips that said never leave my sight again. There truly was no better sight in the world, the doctor thought. As he got up and straightened the creases in his jacket, he spotted his companion in the distance, who was bounding towards him at some pace. Doctor, oh, thank the stars, she said, meeting her friend with a painful hug. The doctor said nothing, reluctantly returning the embrace. What happened? Lily asked, releasing the doctor from her hold. Perhaps because he didn't know how to, or perhaps because he didn't want to. The doctor didn't answer. Instead, he watched the people celebrate the miracle of Erskaving, each in their own and brilliant way. Well, I suppose it doesn't matter, does it? Point is, you did it. Are they all back? The doctor asked. Every single one. And they all appeared exactly where they disappeared, just like you, she explained. As if it never happened. I don't get it. I guess you must have just spat them out, the doctor hypothesized. Still, like you said, they're back. And that's all that matters. We did it. We did it, Billy echoed. Brilliant, the doctor exclaimed. Absolutely fantastic. The little blue box hummed contently beside the forest trees as Lily made her way back from the town. She'd had one last check of everything, making absolutely sure that the place was as it should have been, and then said her goodbyes to Hannah and her grandfather. She'd made it brief, the doctor was, as always, eager to move on. Entering the TARDIS, Lily saw the doctor at the console, pushing buttons and pulling levers as if it all made perfect sense. She smiled as their eyes met. Right, I'm ready to go, she announced. Cracking, the doctor said, pressing another button. Are you alright? she asked, sensing a hint of sadness in the doctor. Fine, yeah, fine, he replied. Good, she uttered, though she didn't buy his response. So, what happens now? You really do ask a lot of questions, Lily, he remarked. Lily strained slightly. Is that a problem? she inquired. Not at all responded. Questions are one of the most important things in the universe. They can bring down power-mad tyrants, end thousand-year wars, prevent civilizations from causing their own destruction, and I've seen it firsthand. Empires falling at the ask of a question. As for yours, it depends. If you mean what happened to Erskabing, presuming we haven't changed the course of history, they'll do just fine. They'll tell their stories just like humans do, and every time it's told, the details will change until the story reaches one Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, and the story gets translated by Mr. Browning into the text that I read many years ago. I'm sure I still have it somewhere. The doctor looked around half-heartedly, as if the text might have been lying on the floor beside him. If you're asking about the Earl King, who knows? Maybe I killed it. I doubt it, though. I was hoping I might be able to track it down, if it's still alive, follow it, and stop it from ever doing this again. There's nothing. I mean nothing. No DNA, no leftover energy. According to the TARDIS, it's literally just vanished. And other than the fiction on Earth, there's no record of an Earl King ever existing. Not on any database anywhere in the known universe. The name doesn't exist. The description doesn't match anything. Whatever it is, it's a ghost, metaphorically speaking. And if you're asking about us, well, I don't know. I'm a Time Lord, not a soothsayer, but I think our story's far from over, don't you? Lily afforded him a smile. Absolutely, she replied. The doctor smiled back, breathed deep, and pulled one last lever. Too busy celebrating, the people of Ereskabin never saw the final miracle of that Christmas Eve, as the Doctor made the little blue box fade away to nothing. Just trees, and grass, and pretty little houses, 
the town was once again at peace. And, just as the children had finally settled for their last sleep before Christmas, they looked out of their windows and smiled. Every single one of them smiled, as it snowed once more in the fairy tale town of Denmark. My father, my father, and dost thou not hear the words that the Earl King now breathes in mine ear? Be calm, dearest child, tis thy fancy deceives, tis the sad wind that sighs through the withering leaves.